citing with angels or demons. But uh, before I go any further, I would like to request everyone in the panel to kindly ensure that the mics are muted so that there is no uh, noise in this uh, conference room. Uh, I could see just one. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And now before we go any further, I would like to invite the moderator of the session, Professor Dr. Suhasini Desai, to kindly address the gathering. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the fourth session of the International Conference on Eradication of Biological and Chemical Weapons. The theme for this session is Biological and Chemical Weapons Siding with Angels or Demons. We are deliberating on this crucial question in truly unprecedented situation. We are witnessing with our own eyes a pilot, I can say, a pilot of what those weapons can potentially do to all of us without sparing anyone. The question of siding with whom, angels or demons, is obviously rhetorical. We know that everyone will be on the side of angels. No one wants to be a demon, no one wants to support a demon. So the real question is how to know between angels and demons. World has been divided for so long between East and West, North and South, rich and poor, haves and have nots, and what not. And us and them, always us and them. In this division, others are always demons, and we are always angels. Our weapons are for defense or for deterrence. Well, their weapons are always for offense. Let us take one example. China says that it was an accident in that uh, laboratory in Wuhan where the scientific research or definitely peaceful scientific research was going on. But others are not ready to believe that and they are out to demonetize demonize this research as a part of weapon development. Sadly, you will perhaps never know what is the truth. So the only real thing is for us that everyone has suffered. Angels and demons, whatever you call yourself, everyone has suffered. These weapons, unfortunately or fortunately, cannot recognize angels and demons. What is the difference? This is good, this is bad, good human being, bad human being, this nation, that nation, it won't recognize and we are experiencing it that. They destroy both. So I'm reminded of image of Basmasur in Indian mythology. You must all know the story of Basmasur, a demon endowed with the power to turn anything that he touches into ashes. Needless to say, he ends up himself turning into ashes. It is this myth that is playing out again in front of our eyes. How can we avoid this gloomy prognosis from coming true? Can we avoid this? Can we stop dividing ourselves between us and them, between angels and demons? Can we instead do one thing? We can come together as mankind, as humanity, and point at these weapons themselves as demons? Can we rephrase the war as one between us humans and those demons? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure the erudite panelists of this session will show us the way out. The way, way out can come from, it can come in different ways. From science, from strategy, from diplomacy. We have these experts from very diverse fields with a vast, huge experience behind them in very high places. So they all are working only for humanity and not for or against this or that, any of the nation. Right. In my short introduction, I cannot help but recall the famous lines of the song Imagine by legendary John Lennon of Beatles. Imagine there is no countries, nothing to kill or die for. You may say, I'm a dreamer. I hope it comes true someday. And with this note, 
I thank all of you. And uh, now it is over to Professor Mahmoud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for those opening remarks. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining this important session. And it's now time uh, to have our digital picture perfect moment. So I request everyone uh, in the panel to kindly switch on their cameras and keep them on throughout the session. So if I may request Pravin Patelji, uh, Honorable Chancellor, Vice Chancellor N.T. Rao, sir, uh, everyone to please uh, put on their cameras. Yes, what a beautiful moment. Uh, Darshan Mudraji, if you could please uh, come online. Thank you. I'm sure uh, we have a very good moment here. You can keep your microphone camera uh, microphones off. Uh, you can just uh, keep your camera on so that uh, there is no noise. But the visuals are very beautiful. Uh, Dr. Flora, we don't have online. Yeah, we we don't do not see Dr. Uh, HS Flora. If you could please, uh, if camera can be turned on from that side. Dr. Flora, sir. I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nilesh. All set. Yeah. Just yeah. Just, just a moment. Oh, what a beautiful panel. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. And I'm sure uh, the digital photographer must be clicking in its own uh, different way. <laughs> and the picture would have been taken by now. Thank yeah. you. Thank it, you very it, much. It uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. My team confirms that the photo has been taken. And now let's move. Uh, I would like to again go to my technical team as I request them to kindly relay a small film made on the theme of this particular session. Over to my IT team. Research and development in biology inspired by the power race has led to development of super sophisticated weapons of mass destruction. COVID-19 has made the world oddly conscious about this man-made threat. Let us analyze whether biological and chemical weapons are siding with angels or demons at international conference on eradication of biological and chemical weapons thank you very much uh, for that short film uh, which underlined the importance of uh, this particular session and uh, without uh, wasting a single minute because time is extremely crucial and uh, uh, we have learned it in a very very special way in this digital platform where uh, in a minute, uh, people can join from all across the globe. So respecting their time is extreme uh, of extreme importance. So I would like to request everyone in the panel to uh, restrict themselves uh, to 15 minutes of time. Uh, I request everyone uh, to stick to that so that we can take maximum number of questions. And everyone in the audience, I would like to request you once again, because right now we have 350 people online in this particular session. I request all of you to Please post your questions only in questions and answers box. Please do not post your questions in chat box. They won't be addressed. So I request you to put your questions in questions and answers. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Professor Gautam Bapat. Uh, you will find my name in the Q&A section. So please post uh, individually to my window so that I'll be able to address your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's time when I move on to the next uh, point on agenda. We have with us our young youth student leader from MIT World Peace University, Jairam Thapa with us. I would request uh, Mr. Jairam Thapa to address the gathering. Over to you, Mr. Jairam. If you could please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, one and all present. I am Jay from MIT School of Economics. What I think uh, it is absolute responsibility of the inventors think about what it is that they are inventing because all inventions have unforeseen consequences like many countries power large portions of their electrical grid as a result of nuclear energy but the flip side of that is hiroshima and nagasaki i am not suggesting that any specific technology be prohibited i think technology should be developed and we should push our scientific and technological limits but at the same time inventors need to understand that they have a responsibility and so 
they should consider what it is that they are building and how it might be abused and how it could harm others. This simply means they themselves have some moral responsibility. In the recent times, when conventional warfare is almost disappearing, biology is being used for killing humankind. Despite all the marvels that this particular field gifts human beings with, one must not forget its role in almost wiping out life from the face of Earth. The same biological research that was initiated as a savior of humans has been turned into an assassin by some realist powers. History has witnessed biological hazard that has affected cities and countries. Like if we talk about chemical weapons, their modern usage began with World War I when both sides to the conflict used poisonous gas to cause significant battlefield casualties. As a result of public outrage, the Geneva Protocol, which prohibited the use of chemical weapons in a warfare, was signed in 1925. While a welcome step, the protocol had a significant number of shortcomings, including the fact that it did not prohibit the development, production, and stockpiling of chemical weapons. And soon after World War I, state went, went for bioweaponizing themselves in order to have superiority over their enemy. Although after the establishment of United Nations, numerous treaties and regimes came into force and banned any such actions which could harm the human race, the Biological Weapon Convention stands to halt such horrendous actions to eliminate humans. But I think there is a lot more to be done. The use of biological weapons is a serious problem and the risk of using these weapons in an attack is increasing. But what I think with great power comes great responsibility. This line would most likely bound together the use of chemistry and biology in our lives. We all are aware of their great power which covers all the world in all aspects. Unfortunately, some people take advantage of this power to hurt and destroy the lives of others. In the case of current pandemic of COVID-19, the entire community has come to a standstill and a serious threat has been posed to mankind. And also there is serious ambiguity as from where the virus has actually originated. There arises an urgent need of imposing serious restriction bans on research and development of biological and chemical weapons so that the mankind is not threatened and the path of world peace is followed. I would like to conclude by saying that we need not stop the technological advancement, but we need to protect our inventions from going into the wrong hands. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jay. As a, thank you very much for addressing uh, this on this important topic. And thank you for sharing with us uh, and representing the entire student community. Uh, now it's my honor and privilege uh, to take you to our next esteemed speaker who's uh, with us uh, today. And it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce you to Honorable Mr. Andrew Weber, non-resident senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, Belfast Center. Mr. Andrew C. Weber was a senior fellow at Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs, Harvard University. Weber is a former deputy coordinator of Ebola response at U.S. Department of State. From 2009 to 2014, Mr. Weber served as an assistant secretary of defense for nuclear, chemical, and biological defense programs. We are indeed honored and privileged to have you here today with us, sir. Thank you very much for joining in. And without wasting a single more minute, I can hand over the control to you. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, gathering on a, a subject which is vital to the world and also very personal uh, to me. Uh, I've spent the bulk of my career working on these problems. And while the 20th century was the nuclear age, clearly the 21st century is the age of biology. And I believe both the, the greatest threat and the greatest opportunity uh, for our species is in uh, biology. What we do in this field will really um, make the difference between a bountiful century and a destructive uh, century. Uh, I do have a, a slide presentation. Um, I'm not sure if it's possible to uh, to show um, to display that. Um, if um, if not, I can imagine the slides, uh, as John Lennon um, said and <laughs> was quoted in his own uh, remarks. Let me just check with my team. Uh, have you sent it to my team already? 
Uh, yes, uh, last okay. week. I'm, I'm sharing. Uh, so can I'm we sharing. have? Uh, uh, right yeah, please, please put the presentation on for Mr. Weber. Okay. Uh, so, well, but Mr. Weber could share the screen directly too. No, I think he's on mobile device. Okay. okay. Um, the um, the well, the topic is, uh, as I said, is personal to me, and, and the um, there we go. So um, I'm going to talk about some of my uh, personal involvement in this topic. Uh, the Soviet Union had the, the world's largest uh, offensive biological weapons program that was increased dramatically after the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention went into force in 1975. Of course, the United States ended its biological weapons program by order of President Nixon in 1975. 69. And after the Soviet Union collapse, I was assigned to the United States Embassy in a, a new country called uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, the next slide, please. And while serving uh, at the Embassy in Kazakhstan, uh, we were invited um, by the President, uh, uh, President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, uh, to uh, a secret visit of this massive biological weapons factory that was in a previously secret city that didn't appear on maps during the Soviet period in a place just over the Russian border in northern Kazakhstan called Stepnogorsk. And standing, um, I'm standing in front of a, an enormous building the size of uh, two football fields that was the world's largest anthrax factory. And it was built in the 1980s after the BWC had gone into force. Um, my visit to this facility really uh, changed, altered the course of my life and my career. And uh, after seeing uh, the scale of this facility, um, I decided that I would dedicate the bulk of my uh, professional career to eliminating the scourge of biological weapons. Next slide, please. Other way, yes. So what we're looking at here is the bottom of a four-story high bioreactor or fermenter. Um, it's one of 10 20,000 liter fermenters in uh, this inside the building at Stepnogorsk. The entire uh, fermentation hall was in biosafety level four, the highest level of biocontainment. The workers wore uh, space suits with breathable air because of the dangerous work. And this facility, just an unimaginable scale. At the time, I, I could only think of it as, as evil or uh, demonic would be a good word for today. It was built and proven to be capable of producing during a wartime mobilization period of just under eight months, 300 metric tons of anthrax agent. And if you can imagine a gram of, of anthrax can kill hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. 300 tons was enough to wipe out uh, the species several times over. And this was just one of many biological weapons facilities that the Soviet Union had built. And thanks to the cooperation from the government of Kazakhstan and their decision upon independence to renounce all weapons of mass destruction, we worked uh, together over um, quite a long period to very safely and carefully dismantle this horrible facility. And if you were to go there today, thanks to the Department of Defense Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, you would just see uh, grass growing in a green field. This facility, thankfully, no longer exists. Next slide, please. So 15 years ago, I visited the country of Ukraine. Uh, and here we are uh, in August of 2005 with a then young senator from the state of Illinois uh, in a public health um, diagnostic laboratory in downtown Kiev. And in that refrigerator behind me, 
um, there was a this tray that is in my hand, and I'm holding a vial of Bacillus anthracis, uh, which is the bacteria that causes anthrax. And we see a very concerned young senator um, who then went on to make countering biological threats one of the priorities of, of his presidency. And what's telling about this slide is that while this is a legitimate uh, public health laboratory doing uh, important work um, on diagnosing endemic diseases, and anthrax was occasionally uh, endemic uh, in Ukraine, especially uh, cutaneous anthrax, um, it's the nature of biology that it's dual use. Um, some people misconstrue that biological weapons have to be attached to a bomb or explosives and blow up. No, actually what's in my hand, that small vial right there is a biological weapon that could be misused uh, to kill um, many, many, many people. So it's that dual use nature that makes it so difficult to control because one day a facility could be doing peaceful research and the next day um, it, it could be misused for um, creation of biological weapons. I believe the threat of biological weapons is increasing today uh, for a few reasons. One is because the technologies are becoming um, ubiquitous. They're getting uh, much cheaper uh, and more accessible, knowledge has spread around the world. And for those very, very few uh, demons in the world, uh, the possibility to, to abuse biology and misuse it for evil intent um, is very real. So we can work together. I was involved in the Ebola response in West Africa in 2014, and President Obama and other leaders of the world, we mobilize over 70 countries to work together with the United Nations, with the World Health Organization, to help eradicate that disease outbreak before it spread around the world. And that was a great success and an example of what we're not doing today, what we need to be doing. But COVID-19 also is a global demonstration of the power of biology. And those who would do harm I'm sure see this example of the destructive capacity of biology as uh, perhaps a reminder that biological weapons could be much worse than even the COVID pandemic today, and that they will perhaps redouble their efforts to develop uh, biological weapons for offensive purposes. And I'm currently with the Council on Strategic Risks and we created a program last year on making biological weapons obsolete. Indeed, that's the, the theme of this conference, to eradicate biological weapons. And it's my firm belief that the technology uh, revolution in biology makes it possible for us, through better preparedness, to deter and prevent biological weapons to the point where those seeking to develop them, whether it be a terrorist group or a state with an illegal biological weapons program, that they will be dissuaded because they will think that biological weapons would not be effective. And by this, I mean some of the capabilities that are being demonstrated today against the COVID or the coronavirus um, give, show, demonstrate for the first time these rapid medical countermeasure capabilities. We need a system of early warning for pandemics and we can prevent the next pandemic as well as um, the use of biological weapons by investing in these technologies that allow us to get early warning of the first few cases. And then with the genetic sequence to create within days or <clears throat> weeks, medical countermeasures, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics to counter these diseases to the point where our adversaries would realize that biological weapons will not be effective and therefore they would stop pursuing them. So my appeal to you and especially to the students in the audience today is to dedicate a portion of their careers and, and their 
professional lives to this really a visionary effort to make biological weapons obsolete so that the 21st century is not darkened, as President Obama said, by the very worst weapons of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Thank you very much for those important inputs and sharing your experience and what you've been through. And I'm, I'm sure that the mo uh, what would have been that moment when you would have visited that facility and seen that something can be built of that size that could wipe off the entire humanity from the face of this planet. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your experience. And please be there because we are getting many, many questions already. I'm started uh, flooding with the questions. I uh, started getting all of them, so please be there. Uh, yes. Next, uh, we have, uh, thank you. Next, we have with us our next eminent speaker of, of this particular session, and it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce him to all of you. Honorable Dr. S.J.S. Flora, the Director of uh, National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and Research. Dr. Flora is currently the Director of National Institute of Pharmaceutical Education and uh, Educational Research at Raiburili, India. Before joining the current position in year 2016, he served for nearly 27 years as senior scientist and head of division of pharmacology, toxicology, and regulatory toxicology at Defense Research and Development Establishment, Gwalior, India. He got his PhD from CSIR, Indian Institute of Toxicology Research, India, in year 1985 and was a postdoctoral research associate at Utah State University, United States of America. His most highlighted contribution has been the development of new drug for therapy of chronic arsenic poisoning, which was approved by the Drug Controller General of India and has finished phase one human clinical. He has published nearly 282 research papers, eight research articles in international books, three patents, and more than 10,000 citations in international literature. He has published uh, three books, including a prestigious handbook of arsenic toxicology published by prestigious elsewhere in the United States of America. My goodness, I mean, being a teacher, uh, I'm seeing those numbers of publication, and I think that proves to many of us that it is possible in one lifetime. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for joining in today in this important session with us. And without wasting a single minute, I hand over the control to you. Over to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Gautam, for, for a very elaborative uh, introduction. I still consider that still uh, I'm a student of pharmacology. Uh, but thank you once again for inviting me for this important conference. Uh, I believe uh, this conference could not have held in a better time than this. Honestly, one thing I must uh, admit at the beginning that uh, this webinars and web seminars is something which I hate to give, uh, but the sort of invitation I got from you, I just could not say no, because it's better to have interaction one-to-one, -one, but well, we have to live with it. Well, I was told that uh, there are a number of students are there. Uh, they are from different uh, multidisciplinary fields. So I have prepared a small presentation, perhaps for the benefit of the students. Uh, once Andrew is there, because I know him and I know his uh, work from my DRDO days. Uh, but I think uh, that presentation will be more about the introduction of uh, what is uh, chemical and what is biological warfare. Uh, but the title which shows that he uh, is uh, siding with angels or demons, but I feel that there is no choice. I mean, we have to live with it, whether we like it or we don't like it. So my presentation is nothing to promote anything, but only just to apprise the students, particularly the youngsters, as Andrew very nicely said at the last, that we have to live with it and we have to prepare ourselves for that. So my presentation of about 15 minutes will be entirely to show the students that is all about. Can I have a slide? Just give me one second. One thing I will start with the beginning, but uh, at the moment, uh, 
as uh, that young that there is a more conventional war we are going to see in next decade or more because the time of uh, a conventional war with the weapons uh, i think perhaps is over now the war will be more of like uh, what uh, i just said uh, is will be more like using chemical and biological weapons and uh, right now just for the benefit of this youngsters uh, there is a myth that people say that the most of the natural chemicals they are not harmful but that's not the truth most of the natural chemicals uh, some of the pictures which i'm showing uh, they are also equally toxic and same is true for the synthetic chemicals that they are not necessary sir i'm sorry to interrupt you but uh, are there few controls of the webex software in the on the screen in front of you in the middle of slide if you could please move them because uh, they are obstructing the view One second. Yeah, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. It's not moving now. yeah just uh, i'll show you some of this particular slide shows that all substances are poisonous it's the dose which defines that what is how much is the toxicity i have shown very common uh, chemicals like aspirin and you can see on the right side that what is the toxic dose of aspirin same is true for vitamin e and c even now uh, a, a sodium chloride uh, salt is have is have a toxicity because the dose which defines a toxicity now talking about the chemical and biological weapons i'll just quickly go through all these slides because i want to come to the point where which, which i would like to define more in detail a uh, number of instances have happened in the past when uh, uh, countries fighting a war has accused the other country that uh, they have used the chemical weapons or even biological weapon but there is not much instance of biological weapon which has been uh, come to the fore but it is like chemical weapon which has been uh, used many times in the past uh, most important one has been the iran iraq war when they uh, iran accuses israel of using chemical weapon in gaza now talking about the weapon of mass destruction strategy nuclear biological and chemicals honestly speaking uh, this is my perception that it is the fear which is more dangerous perhaps than the actual effect because the most of the effects they are secondary and then uh, death is the most mainly happens after secondary infection so it's the fear which is more uh, dangerous perhaps than the actual effect this slide uh, clearly defines the difference between the chemical and a biological weapon <clears throat> as you can see on the first the speed at which attacks result in sickness chemical in case of chemical warfare agents it's a slow because it confines to only a small place but in case of biological it spreads very very rapidly and same is the true with distribution of affected patient it confines when it is there is a chemical warfare attack or a chemical weapon attack it confines to a particular place but in case of biological warfare the effects are uh, it all depends upon the when there are many other fact, environmental factor which defines biological weapons again the release of site of the release site of weapon is only confined to a small place when in case of biological you cannot even find it out whether uh, there's some biological attack is there or not now in case of chemical weapon you can decontaminate both the patients as well as the environment but in biological uh, warfare scenario it's largely not possible to decontaminate a patient or the environment this is a very state uh, statement which may not be true in some cases but it's a general statement which i am talking about now a a very simple definition for a biological warfare agent is a living organism or the byproduct of a living living or, organism which generally we call it as a toxin that causes the disease and that lead to incapacitation the idea behind using of biological or even a chemical weapon is that the enemy uh, soldiers can be made incapacitated i'm just giving an example that it is using a malaria uh, or if there is a problem will happen it will have a only at a very local site 
and the most of the soldiers will be in capacity and they will be to fight like threat of height is what i said at the beginning that bioweapons attack is horrible actual risk of happening is low but maybe not to my current scenario because there is a great allegation that covid-19 is a, a sort of bioweapon because it's not been proved so i'll just restrict my statement to that that the effects could be horrible as in case of uh, covid-19 which we have all are experienced the risk is real and complacency will produce awful consequences when the impossible happens and that is exactly what is happening here a serious threat from bioweapon and assess the seriousness and get ready for the management of situation that is what i am trying to say that you have to be ready with this this is how uh, why now the countries are seeing as a alternate to the conventional war because you require only a small amount and it's a cheap and easy to produce can be spread as an aerosol effects are not immediate you will know only after maybe months or even after weeks the effects will be visible mostly as i said at the beginning the effects will be secondary effects because if you may be getting exposed to something but the effects will be secondary secondary there may be a pulmonary edema there may be some other problems like in case of chemical weapons the effects of sulfur mustard appears only in a blistering form but there will be a secondary infection which i'll show in next few slides easy to hide and do not destroy any material this is just a quickly i'll go through two, two or three slides that history of biological weapon this is this happens in the uh, world war 1 when germany accused use of bio weapons and then as uh, the young man uh, said that 1925 the geneva protocol was signed that prohibits the use in war of poisonous gases and bacterial then after world war 1 there has been instances of use of biological weapon but not used in uh, europe in uh, world war 2 1935 japan used human subjects for testing of plague and and that these are all allegation which are there in the textbooks in 5060 there has been uh, age of uh, rnd and uh, as also been told earlier that nixon terminated the use of biological program in 1969 and then in 1972 biological and toxic uh, warfare convention was signed Uh, these are again the some instances you all know about what happened in uh, 2001 then when uh, bioterrorism happened and then tax force were uh, filled us letters were delivered and uh, there have been mortality these are the some characteristic of a biological warfare agent in infectivity this is exactly what happens uh, you are all seeing it and you are all uh, come uh, news in there, there is a, there is a lot of infection now is this virulence factors toxicity pathogenicity these are all the characteristics of a biological warfare use these are typical agents which has been used or has been allegedly been used as a warfare agent as uh, and you just said anthrax plague this again the this glanders cholera this may be not be all human agents uh, they may be affecting animals even extend that even in agriculture they have been used uh, to affect the uh, is what we call bio agriculturism ebola hemorrhagic fever and the uh, agent most likely to be used in in this case is anthrax plague and botulinum biological warfare again human pathogen these are all very common uh, what you can call is bio biological warfare agents plague animal pathogens these are all been used by terrorism again it leads to loss of human life animals even crops operation efficiencies of true it affects as i said at the beginning that it it reduces the operational efficiencies of true when it has been used serial c affected morbidity and both mortality will happen security breach to vital and strategic installation uh, and destruction of vital resources now quickly come to chemical warfare agent and you all that there have been number of chemical warfare agent and they have It is nervage and uh, typical uh, nervage things and listing agent as a buster. They are very common uh, listing agent. Even uh, arsenic has been used as a listing agent. Uh, blood agents, including cyanide, and these are all typical chemical warfare agents. <laughs> as this is toxic to human, as is what we call insecticide, because most of the other agents are organophosphorus. So organophosphorus compounds are less toxic. But these are a very refined form of organophosphorus, like what I said. 
chemical serine, so on, they are all organophosphorus, but they are extremely toxic to, as you can see, that number of uh, uh, chemical warfare has been listed. You can see the uh, tab 25 to 50, uh, 50 is, is all microgram or milligram that we do. Serine, 5 to 20 microgram, so on, 5 to 20 microgram. VX most the lethal one. And compared to that, you can see that dichlorophos is 300 to 6,000, this is a really 50. This is a typical uh, case of sulfur mustard poisoning. As you can see, this is a picture, a real picture, which I have taken is from the exposure to sulfur mustard. And uh, this is that these are the blisters. I mean, these are is a gas, which I mean, if, if any contamination will lead to immediate formation of uh, these uh, blisters. These blisters will not kill a, a human being, but there will be a secondary infection, and after secondary infection, there has been a mortality. Not at the uh, particular use of sulfur mustard. Lewisite, as I said, is a typical arsenicals, and the, the toxic manifestation, I have already said, the skin, erythema, and the blisters will happen. In case of uh, blood agent, hydrogen cyanide, typical are the, the one which are being used as a blood agent, are seen. Cyanogen chloride, these are all biological. Uh, this is a typical case of how a cyanide kills human being. It, is, it, reduce, it interacts with the reduced hemo iron of uh, cytochrome oxidase. And then the cytooxidant, it quickly converts into cyto hypoxia condition and hypoxia leads to death. These are lung injuries. I will not go to the, the details. These are the toxins which have been used in back cases of. Uh, uh, biological warfare, bacterial, botulinum toxin is the most toxic among all. Fungal, algal, blood agents, these are typical blood agents. Arsenicals, as I've said, there are three categories of organic arsenic. Arsene is the gas, which has been used and uh, and uh, this led to the development of a drug which I talk about, that British anti lewisite was that which was uh, typically used for treatment of arsenicals. Uh, this is what is our inorganic arsenic conditions. And uh, even to the case, uh, you might all be hearing, you might be reading all about it, that arsenic poisoning has, is happening. There are a number of rumors which are going out from where this arsenic has come into the groundwater. There have been a number of cases, as you all know, that in Bangladesh and in the uh, eastern part of India, there have been 75 million people currently now suffering with arsenical poisoning. And the worst scenario is that we do not have a drug to treat all these cases. I'm just showing one picture of uh, East, East uh, West Bengal. And you can see the red portion where you, you find that all red portion is at cases where even to the extent of 3,000 to 4,000 microgram per liter of arsenic is there in the groundwater. From where it has come is something which people are not been able to. When the WHO say that more than 10 ppb should not be there in the drinking water. But I'm talking about 3,000 to 4,000 arsenic is, has been found in uh, some of the cases. Even in Taiwan, even in the United States, uh, there have been instances of very high amount of arsenic. From where it so has I'm come, extremely sorry to intervene, but we have to keep some time in the reserve for the questions and answers. To you. I'll just wind up in two minutes. Sure, sir. Sure. Sir. Okay, this is just what you can say that most important part is the detection, uh, as Andrew also said and uh, protection. These are some of the big uh, uh, products which we have developed at our own end uh, for the detection kits are there. It can be biosensors, it can be protecting devices, decontamination, and the, these are the drug which again we have developed against different uh, and uh, this is a drug which uh, Gautam said at the beginning that this is a drug which uh, we have developed at my own group. Uh, as I said that the arsenicals, uh, there was a drug which was uh, introduced by Britishers in the law way back in 1942, British anti lewisite But this is a drug which we have developed is the chronic, uh, for the chronic cases of poisoning. And this has already gone through phase two trial and it is ready now. It's a very good replacement of both British anti lewisite and the conventional drug which USFD has already approved that is called DMSA. It's a better form of uh, I'll just uh, leave this slide because there are some benefits of this particular drug because it goes into the intracellular sites and brings them out. What my message from this particular slide is that yes, threat is there, both of biological warfare and chemical warfare. But we have to be ready with uh, our own system where we have to find it out some detection system, we have to find out some protection devices. And once there is no 
remedy, you have to find a therapeutic agents. So I urge the youngster to find out some new topics where you can find some uh, objectives, some passion to go for this protection and detection and as well as therapeutic agents. Uh, I think I'll just uh, leave it here. The challenge is to reduce the risk to manageable and acceptable levels. The existing health and medical facility with rapid detection and protection system will play an important role. And again, my urge is that there is a very least uh, work is going on as far as the therapeutic is concerned. We have to find whether the vaccine or in case of chemical warfare agents, we have to find quickly some drug. Quickly, uh, That is the only remedy which I can say. And the message for all the youngsters is that we have to live with this, whether it's a corona or whether it's a chemical warfare, biological warfare, this is a, our future, but we have to be ready for it. We have to make our country prepared. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful speech. Thank you very much for sharing a great amount of knowledge in this particular session with us. Thank you very much for that. And it is now time that when I invite the next eminent speaker of this session, Honorable Ambassador Shri, Rajendra M. Abhyankarji, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce him to all of you. Honorable Ambassador Sri Rajendra M. Abhyankarji, former Foreign Secretary of India, Professor of, of Practice of Diplomacy and Public Affairs at O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, Indiana University, Bloomington. At the, at the time of his uh, retirement in 2005, Ambassador Rajendra Abhyankar was India's ambassador to the European Union, Belgium and Luxembourg. His professional career included, includes 37 years of Indian diplomacy, serving as ambassador to Azerbaijan, Syria, and Turkey, High Commissioner to Cyprus, and Deputy High Commissioner to Sri Lanka. He has also been India's Consul General in San Francisco. Since then, Ambassador Abhyankar has been working in the areas of academics, corporate philanthropy, consulting, and international track to dialogues. He, has a, he was the director of the Center for West Asian Studies and Professor at Jamia Milia Islamia University in New Delhi, Director and Advisor for the Asia's Foundations Program in India and President of the Hinduja Foundation in Mumbai. Ambassador Pinkar holds position on a number of philanthropic and charitable foundations. He is the Chair of the Kurzu Center for Defense Studies and Research Pune. Kunzru, I'm sorry. Uh, while at O'Neill, he has initiated collaboration between educational institutions in India and with other countries. Ambassador Pyankar is a frequent speaker on international affairs at universities and think tanks around the world and contributes regularly to newspapers and journals in international issues. Where he speaks French, Italian, Greek, Turkish and Arabic, addition to many Indian languages. We are really, really honored to have you here today with us. Sir. Thank you very much for joining in. And without wasting a single minute, I hand over the control to you. Over to you, sir. If you could please unmute yourself and uh, yeah. You just click on the screen and then the buttons would up. Yeah, yeah, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. OK. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this occasion. I'm really happy to hear the two earlier speakers, Professor Weber and uh, um, Professor Flora, uh, to, uh, who have brought out the tremendous effects of both biological weapons and chemical weapons, of the fact that there is an unbridled expansion of both biological weapons and chemical weapons going on in this century. As I think uh, Dr. Weber said, that, if, that this century is probably going to be determined largely by biological weapons and perhaps as well by, by chemical weapons rather than nuclear weapons. Um, interestingly, this is, has really been the choice for many countries who have faced the reason, who have faced the desire to have nuclear weapons. When they say that a nuclear weapon is easy to make, it's not all that easy when you think about it. 
and a number of countries. And here I specifically refer to Syria, where I used to be the Indian ambassador, who decided that since every attempt they made to set up a, a nuclear plant in order to actually create nuclear weapons were defeated by Israeli attacks, they decided to concentrate in a major way on chemical weapons. It was only in 2013 that thanks to Russian persuasion, the Syrian President Assad gave up his chemical weapons in exchange for what we can say was longevity in his job because the Western powers knew that only he, if he remained, would be able to actually eliminate all the chemical weapons. Nevertheless, chemical weapons have been used more than 300 times in the nine year, almost 10 year uh, civil war going on in, in Syria. As far as biological weapons are concerned, once again, we, uh, one would not want to uh, characterize necessarily a, the rapid spread of COVID-19 as a biological weapon being used against the rest of the world. But I assure you that there is a large section of the world's population which believes that there is some design in the way this particular illness or this virus has spread around the world. But the, what I would like to deal with, to start with, is the fact that the natural question that arises when one listens to my preceding speakers is that what is the world doing about it? Well, to, in both cases, there was a protocol of uh, protocol of the Geneva Protocol of 1925, but the world has moved greatly since then. So, to put it on record, as far as the biological weapons are concerned, we have the Biological Weapons Convention. The full form of it is the Convention on the Prohibition of the Development, Production, and Stockpiling of bacteri Bacteriological, Biological, and toxin weapons and on their destruction. So it's a very comprehensive convention which was open for signature in 1972 but came into force in 1975. By the end of August 2019, 183 members, uh, countries were members of this convention, which is just about 10 short of the membership of the United Nations. The convention is very, very uh, wide and covers a range of biological weapons or, or biological substances that can be weaponized as part of uh, an aggressive tactic. What it really also has tried to um, highlight is a simple thing, which is the deliberate use of disease as a weapon of war. Now, this is not a new idea. Since 1300s, we have, we know of instances where bodies with plague were thrown into water or thrown into communities in order to uh, spread the virus. Even the simple business of one king uh, ensuring that the water supply of another was poisoned was all part of biological warfare. So it's not something that uh, we can easily get rid of. But at the same time, the biological convention has put down very clear idea, I have put down very clear ideas about how this can be controlled. Um, interestingly, Article 1 of the Biological Weapon Convention does not explicitly prohibit the use of biological weapons. Although in the 1996 review of the 
of the treaty, it said that, the, that although use is not explicitly prohibited under Article 1 of the BWC, it still is considered to be a violation of the Convention. So there is a large gray area. One gray area is the fact that there is not an explicit prohibition on the use of biological weapons, biological substances as a weapon. Uh, but the other issue is that there is no real verification mechanism which are what we can call a legally binding verification regime, which it would be possible, which would make it possible for the convention to go into each country and find out what was the research, what was the development of substances which can be used for biological uh, weaponization. The other important point is that um there has been in this last in the last few decades maybe the last 50 years a tremendous increase in the applicability of weaponization capabilities to a large number of biological substances because of artificial biology because of biological enhancement which are not covered presently by the biological weapons so these are the shortfalls of the biological weapon. On the other hand, if one looks at the chemical weapon convention, this also has been in existence for a number of years now. It was open for signature, the chemical weapon convention in 1993 and entered into force in 1997. Currently, it has 193 members who are state parties. The chemical convention is in many ways better organized because uh, there is the organization, the OPC, the Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, which is based in The Hague, which has the ability to look at the situation regarding chemical weapons in each member state. And in fact, it was the OPCW, which was given the task to unearth the use of chemical weapons, <coughs> due, uh, which continues to have the task to unearth the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian situation. Now, this convention prohibits the development, the production, the acquisition, stockpiling, and the retaining of chemicals or even the direct or indirect transfer of chemical weapons um, or encouraging, assisting or inducing other states to engage in CWC prohibited activities. Of course, we saw the photographs, the pictures of some of the effects of chemical weapons, which basically chemical warfare agents fall into four major classes, nerve, blister, choking and blood agents. These are the four, there's a range of uh, effect that can be created by weaponizing chemicals. Now, as one can see, the whole issue boils down to one thing, that as uh, the, the youth leader who introduced the whole subject said, that the inventor of a particular um, substance bears a responsibility. The question is, does he really bear the responsibility? Because we are going to have scientists inventing a whole range of uh, substances, <clears throat> a whole number of uses of these substances. It is really not for the inventor to because some of these substances also have positive effects but it is not really for the inventor to use a moral this option whether or not to invent a particular thing the real issue is 
that it is in the minds of the users or the mind of the aggressor where you have to tackle this it is probably too far fetched to think that we can ever outlaw war or conflict in the world that the world learned well after the first world war which was supposed to be the war to end all wars far from it so we have today a situation where there is a limited amount of work limited limited amount of action that one can take the united nations security council is supposed to be the body which can look at the violation of either the chemical weapon convention or the biological weapon convention by any particular country but today the united nations security council especially the five permanent members who have to agree and have a veto are not in a position to even agree on simple things forget about trying to solve these bigger problems that the world faces that is the tragedy that the entire un system has become unproductive and conflicted with the result we today <clears throat> have a situation where on the one hand we will continue to have development of biological weapons of chemical weapons on the other hand the effort to curb these developments will also continue this is where we are at the present moment thank you i think i will end stop here and look for any questions which i can amplify thank you yes yes that, i think there are a lot because there are almost 450 members live and uh, they have posted a lot many questions uh, let me just uh, reach out to the questions and answers and i'm sure uh, everyone has posted uh, the messages and uh, the questions i would say uh, in the question and answer box only so here we go uh, i i can see uh, sir weber online i can see sir abhankar online but i do not see mr flora dr flora are you there with us please uh, join us yeah yeah i think your camera is uh, switched yeah yeah great great good great now now you now is there okay so here we go so the first question is uh, uh for mr weber uh, and the question is from durba jyoti deb and the question is sir what form of global governance we can have to tackle the problem uh, of these uh, weapons well clearly we need a better form of of governance than we have now um the ambassador um points out that with the permanent five members of the un security council divided uh, uh, excuse me sorry to interrupt you sir uh, i think yes. a few mics are on the audio is echoing so if you could please if you're not speaking please uh, keep your microphone mute so that there won't be an echo sorry mr weber please go on these types of issues the, unfortunately the united nations is weakened by the division that the ambassador just pointed out um within the uh, un security council and that makes it very difficult uh for that venue to help lead as it did um in my experience during the 2014 west africa ebola crisis um organizations like the world health organization are vital uh, un organizations on chemical weapons the organization nobel prize winning organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons is vital but these uh institutions have been weakened in, in the last few years uh in part by the um uh somewhat destructive uh, attitude of the current leadership in my country and what we need is a rebuilding of these global um governance institutions because all of the threats that we're discussing today and others that we haven't discussed like climate change are indeed global and no one country or even group of countries can deal with them 
we have to deal with them True. as an entire world. So thank you. True. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Uh, the next question is coming for Dr. Flora. Uh, Dr. Flora, if you could please unmute yourself. And the question is from Tejinder Singh. And uh, Tejinder Singh asks, the development of biological and chemical weapons is probably uncontrollable. Uh, why don't the scientific fraternity concentrate on development of shield uh, against the known or uh, predictable threats? Well, I don't really know what Mr. Tejinder means by shield, but I think you're the better one to address. Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to understand what he means by sheets. I mean, sheets, it, it's, it's talking about the protective devices. And, uh, Probably. This, it is uh, already on. I mean, I have shown some of the pictures where we have developed such type of sheets where uh, you can protect yourself. You can go and uh, there are uh, even houses have been built where the soldiers can be uh, kept inside where they can be protected from any chemical or biological weapon attack. So I think if he's asking about this, I think my answer is yes. There are, there are research going on and they are already been done. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Flora. Uh, the next question is coming for uh, Rajendra Bhankarji. And the question is coming from Jaita Brahma. And the question is, it is said that the ethics and science cannot go hand in hand. And will this conflict continue even though we are uh, facing such kind of issues with the mankind? So do you believe that the ethics and science will not go hand in hand and will it continue? The big question. Yes, you said ethics and science, is it? Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, ethics and science, uh, where, when has it ever gone hand in hand? But um, we are talking specifically of uh, the weaponization of some of the things, especially B and C weapons. In this matter, the, the amount of development that takes place is going to be phenomenal in the coming, in this century. Whether there is any ethics to it is, some, is going to be very difficult even to look at. So I agree with the with the question, questioner that ethics and science do not always go together. I mean, ethics and science have gone together when it has been a question of, for example, right now, there is a search going on, uh, at least in three different places around the world, to look for a vaccine or some antidote to the coronavirus. Now here you have ethics and science working hand in hand, aiming to produce something to, uh, to combat this huge uh, scourge that we have, this pandemic that we have um, around the world. So uh, it's not that it is excluded, it is possible. But we are, when we talk of weaponization, when we talk of, let's say, a destructive uh, aim of a particular invention, then of course there is no ethic. Of course, here again, one can take a slightly different view that, uh, and that goes to the earlier, to the basic theory that uh, my state right or wrong. I mean, that, that is one theory that has, that for the sake of your state, you will do anything you, in which case, if you live by that ethic, then if you develop a advanced weapon, let's say to protect your state, or presumably to protect your state, then you are harnessing your idea of ethics as far as that is concerned. So these are right. movable concepts. Because I agree. Ethics is a sub, is up, up to a point, it is a subjective issue. And it is, it's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with you that, uh, of course, uh, at uh, many point of time, uh, science and ethics must have gone uh, hand in hand. Otherwise, we would have not seen this day at least of whatever technological development and uh, harmony that we have in the world, whatever we have. But we have it, that means that science has gone and uh, ethics have gone in hand in hand. 
Okay, the next question is coming again for uh, Mr. Webb. And it comes from Shikha Chatterjee. And Shikha asks you, sir, how do you think can a common man play his part in eradication of biological weapons? That's a pretty difficult question. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, Mr. Weber, over to you, sir. But for a well, common well, man, well think, it's uh, a difficult question, but I, I think the, the best example of that is, is the response to the current um, COVID-19 pandemic, where the best defense at the moment that we have against this uh, coronavirus is um, personal hygiene. It's changing our behavior at the individual and community level. That's what is saving lives uh, and, and buying us time to develop the vaccines, therapeutics that we need to completely uh, defeat this virus. So everybody has a role to play. And, and at the individual level, things as simple as uh, frequent and thorough washing of hands, the wearing of masks so we don't cough and expose other people to coronavirus is having an impact. And we see that those communities uh, and cultures that uh, most um, rigorously um, follow these be behavioral suggestions of our public health authorities are having a dramatic impact on preventing the spread of coronavirus. So it is an important question, and I think that's a good yeah, example. Definitely. I mean, uh, in yesterday's session, we saw some of the questions were quite indicative, and uh, they were suggesting as if a common man in this world is now almost helpless. I mean, uh, he's just sitting like a duck there. And, uh, uh, probably somebody is coming and targeting and doing something bad and uh, just hitting the sitting ducks. But yes, uh, as you rightly said, we have to play our own role as a community and as an individual. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. The next question uh, is uh, uh, just uh, let me scroll down. Uh, okay, this question is coming from Neeraj Namdev, and he hasn't mentioned uh, to whom he's asking the question. So probably I take the liberty of announcing it is for all. So the question is, uh, do we need to change the way global politics happen where every nation think about uh, their own self-interest? So we can uh, relate it to China's response to handling COVID-19 as they have thought not to inform the world about such outbreaks or, or whatever they did. So, so do you all panelists, respected panelists, think that uh, is there any utter need now to change the way global politics operates? Any one of you can, can take charge and go ahead. Yeah, Bhankar sir, please go ahead. Well, I'd just say that a lot of issues that we are currently dealing with in the world are such that cannot be actually either solved or not solved by a single nation. So this is where what we need uh, is to look at the possibility of systems of global governance, which we have been able to do, let's say in the case of the climate change agreement, and we've been able to do in a number of other cases, because where the entire uh, international community agrees on what are the goals that we need to attain. Let's say if we talk of biological weapons convention. Now there is a, the legal form is there. The convention is there. The problem is that it does not have a mechanism to, uh, which can inspect. It, the second problem is that there is a tremendous increase in the kind of materials and substances that are used for uh, creating biological weapons. Now this is an area where it should be possible to meet Right. certain conditions of global in order to actually have a organization a global organization in place on which with which one would be able to impose a certain discipline now True. all just to mention that all organizations all such organizations will deal with global governance 
are not based on force or power. Mm -hmm. It is really a simple principle that I scratch your back, you scratch my back. And that is how we have a large, increasing number actually of um, global governance systems in place already. So there is no reason why it should not be possible to actually get this thing started. True. Uh, far as the biological weapons are concerned. Thank you. Or far as chemical weapons are concerned. We would also like to understand the views of a scientist like uh, Dr. Flora on politics. I know I'm asking a, a scientist politics, politics question, but uh, any views from your side, sir? Uh, Gautam, uh, I was uh, just will continue from where uh, Ambassador has left, because uh, the question was that whether the global politics is changing. I think it is already changing. I mean, uh, you can see that uh, only one country is on the other side and most of the other countries are already changing their policies. They are trying to help it out. I mean, one country is uh, trying to provide a drug to the other country. Perhaps there is a time already that it is on. I mean, what I feel that global politics has already started showing sign of cooperation as far as uh, that one question which came earlier was ethics. That is what we call scientific ethics. The ethics are already right. changing. And I feel that it is already on. It's a very good question, I mean, to be honest, but it is already on. That is what I feel. Thank you. True. And I also have a last question, which I would like to take quickly from, and I would like to hear, hear from all the three panelists present here. A quick question because uh, uh, the time is uh, running out from my hands. I have just one last minute left in my hand, but I would like to take this question and I would, I would request all the three panelists to answer this question. Uh, the question is from, again, Tejinder Singh. And uh, the question is, is globalization making, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's from Ravi Patel. And Ravi Patel asks, if we establish an international investigation agency to decrease the biological weapons, uh, then do you think it will be a feasible solution, an international investigation agency? Uh, Mr. Weber? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll come to each one of you. I, I, I need uh, from each one of you. Well, I, th I think that is an important uh, idea. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has set up uh, such a capability after the uh, cases of chemical weapons use by the Assad regime in Syria. And actually, the Secretary General of the United Nations can launch an investigation, an investigation into biological um, threats or biological incidents in the world, but has not uh, exercised it in this case. And I think mm -hmm. this would be a, a case where where that kind of an investigation, we know that the, the, the COVID-19 outbreak was not caused by biological weapons, but it is possible that the origin was either um, entirely naturally occurring or some, <laughs> or, or some type of an accidental uh -huh. um, um, laboratory acquired infection, for example, um, from one of the institutions that was working on these very, very dangerous okay. uh, natural viruses. In Thank China. you. L last few seconds in my hand. Uh, uh, Ambassador, sir. Well, um, as I said, you can, we can actually have an inspection unit, and that could be part for the Biological Weapon Convention. It can either be agreed as a part of an exercise in global governance. So from the from the eye of an ambassador, is it a feasible and doable solution? Yes, I think it yeah. is absolutely feasible to actually Great. have a global governance uh, agreement which will cover biological weapons in the process of which it should be possible to set up. I don't think that the Security Council is going to actually get involved with it because different permanent members have different interests and I have some time and again that they are never in sync with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last few seconds with Dr. Flora. Over to you, sir. Yes, uh, I'll quickly, it's a self. the process is already on, Gautam, and uh, I think we are trying to list out, not we are list trying to, this is like in OPCW, what Ambassador said, uh, we are trying to list out what are the actual uh, biological warfare agents because we don't even know that what biological uh, or even agriculture or any other part by agents can be used as a biological weapon. So there is this thing is going, going on, class one, class two, class three, biological weapon. I think there's, uh, the process is already, when I left the RTO, 
I think I was aware that this uh, this process is already on. Uh, they are trying to have a supervised like OPCW. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all dignitaries, for putting your views. But please do not go anywhere because we have last few minutes left in the session, and it is now time that we go for uh, the voting on resolution. And this has been the tradition uh, for the information of everyone here present. So we pose the resolution to each one of you, and even the uh, panelists are requested to vote. Uh, soon after I complete reading uh, the uh, resolution, you would see a polling screen that would come in front of your eyes. So here I go with the resolution. We, the participants at the International Conference on Eradication of Biological and Chemical Weapons, understand that the biological and chemical experiments in the past helped the mankind to fight against the fatal diseases like polio, malaria, typhoid, and cholera. Hence, we appeal that the advancement in biological and chemical research must strictly be used for the progress of humankind and the UN Security Council must consider trade barriers to the countries violating chemical and biological weapons conventions. So this polling is now open to all of you. I request my technical team to open the polling process. Yes, uh, the poll is in front of your eyes. Please vote. Please cast your vote. Even the panelists are requested to cast their vote. Everyone in the audience, please cast your vote. Less than a minute. I'm sure this uh, resolution is pretty clear to all of you. Uh, we have last few seconds left. I'm sure you, all of you have voted. Please go ahead, do not miss this opportunity to let us know that what exactly you think on this very, very important topic. Last 20 seconds, I hope all of you have casted your votes. Please hurry up. Last 10 seconds. Uh, Less than that, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Your time is up. I hope you all have casted your vote. I request my technical team, if they could please share with us the results. Please share the results with us. Uh, I request my technical team to share. Okay, I think it's taking a little time. Uh, Oh, well, great. Uh, no one has uh, casted a vote uh, and uh, everyone who has casted the vote is for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, making us understand your opinion. Thank you very much for that. And uh, without wasting any further minute, I would like to go back to the moderator of this session, Dr. Suhasini Desai, to propose the concluding remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Professor Gautam Bapat, thank you very much. And uh, it has been a very, very interesting session. All the three speakers have uh, really put in all their knowledge and experience in their presentations, in their discussions, when they were answering all the answers and uh, all the questions. And uh, it has been very, very, very informative too. As we know, the uh, pictures speak a uh, million words. So, Mr. Andrew Weber, the photographs, you standing in front of the anthrax weapons uh, manufacturing establishment in Kazakhstan, and uh, another photo of having a biological uh, weapon wobble in your hand and standing next to President Obama will be the permanent memory for all the viewers who are attending this session. And they speak a lot. As you have very correctly pointed out, it doesn't look like a bomb, you know, that it is going to explode. But uh, what, what damage it can do to mankind was so, so evident from your presentation, from your talk. And uh, as you said, you all said that, you know, now we don't have a choice whether uh, biological and chemical weapons are completely not there and we just uh, live in the imaginary world. This is not possible. They are there. We have to live with it. And we have to see that we, how do we deal with this issue? And uh, we, as you always said, even on your LinkedIn profile, I have read that uh, very proudly you have said that you have, you have spent all these years in the 
safety precautions for mankind. So that is your message and uh, that is your dedication. Thank you very much. Uh, our second speaker, Dr. A.J. Flora. Sir, you have really brought in all your, you have taken us to your laboratory and we all have become your students. You were addressing the students out of these viewers, but even the teachers and the panelists, everyone became your student. And we all have gone through all the details of various uh, chemicals and uh, drugs which are being developed. What are the threats? What are the effects? How dangerous they are? And the three keywords you should talk about, detection, protection, and uh, decontamination. If we can have device, we can prepare ourselves to go through all these three, this three point uh, agenda. We can really deal with this. That is your message. And uh, Dr. Abhankar, your uh, presentation was a very true, true talk of uh, a diplomat. The conventions are there, words are there in place, but where is the governance? Why there is no verification mechanism by which we can you know, actually exercise what is written in the conventions? And all of you have very wholeheartedly uh, answered the questions and uh, global governance, common will, and uh, collaboration between different uh, nations to go ahead. That is the message you all have given us. So that is, I can say, the takeaway from all three uh, deliberations from this, in this view. Thank you very much. Over to Professor Gautam. Bhatt. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for your concluding remarks. And now it's time when I request the Pro Vice Chancellor of MIT World Peace University, Group Captain D.P. Upte, to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. It was really. Uh, Nice uh, presentations. Three of you had actually given us details on this subject from different dimensions. And when we, the subject itself was talking about angel or angels or demons, and uh, in particularly in biological and chemical weapons, there is a very thin line between angels and uh, wave uh, demons because they are a dual use kind of things. And uh, already. Uh, during the course of this presentation, uh, Mr. Andrew Weber has given a different dimension and a new hope maybe that he talked about making this, this particular weapons obsolete by using technology and we are not far from that. That's what he says so that usage itself is not a cost productive for the people who are going to use it. So that itself would be a deterrence because that uh, it could be a new point probably I heard and uh, because these are dual use technologies and uh, therefore we need some kind of uh, rebuilding the institutions to make some robust arrangement to identify them and stop them thank you very much sir and dr flora talked about with this interesting presentation giving the details uh, from a scientific point of view and he said that the risk is real uh, he used a very interesting statement. It is a horrible, but actually it is a low. But the risk is real. It is cheap and uh, it takes uh, time. And he's talked about to control them because it's cheap. It will be even small labs can uh, probably produce it. And therefore control is diff uh, difficult and hence cooperation is required. And he said that cooperation is indeed showing now with this corona epidemic. That's what he mentioned, that the things are going in the right direction. So there's a hope for uh, angels. So thank you very much, Dr. Flora. And uh, as uh, Dr. Desai told rightly that uh, Rajendh uh, Abdain Karsar, he was a true diplomat. He knows what is going in and out. What is outside what we see in the United Nations and Security Com Council and things like that, but they are driven by their own selfish motto, as he said, that this, uh, this system has become complicit and unproductive. So they have to now again uh, gear up, all uh, have to put a pressure on them so that there is some kind of investigation mechanism or some independent body who can actually check uh, or investigate and get in the governance. Uh, I don't know if the technology has, uh, will help that or not. 
but definitely a diplomatic efforts will and pressure from the world will help on that thank you very much uh, mr rajendra apekar sir for your interesting uh, talk on this subject and i don't know as andrew weber has said uh, i think like virus uh, this is also virus and otherwise we got a computer also has got a virus but computer side the system is people are so fast now that by the time virus comes in next day or two the antivirus is also available and not very expensive so people can afford or the same antivirus is upgraded all the time maybe one day will come the moment somebody generates a virus and antivirus is already there with the computerized simulation or whatever so human trials are not required so the time can be saved maybe one day we'll see that thank you very much all the panelists i also propose a vote of thanks to our moderator and our vice chair vice chancellor for getting this particular program going thank you very much sir thank you thank you okay, thank you thank you everyone in the panel uh, i would like to uh, share with you that our next session everyone for the attendees our next session would start at 6 pm sharp and it will be a special session on the stories of the survivors of the chemical and biological um, uh, attacks so uh, so please be there join with the new link at 6 pm sharp and uh, uh, i